Today on Back to the Bible. You've heard that you should walk before you run, but the Apostle Paul paid little attention to that advice. Find out why as Pastor Nat Crawford shares reasons for being passionate about growing and going in your faith. Later, he'll bring in Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney to share their passion for outreach as well. You know, here at Back to the Bible, your spiritual journey is our number one priority. So we want you to know that the latest issue of Win the Day is now available. And this month's edition highlights daily steps to help you walk in truth and peace. That's so important in today's chaotic world. So request your copy today at 1-800-759-2425. 1-800-759-2425. Or get the details at backtothebible.org. Well, time now for today's study of Galatians. So let's go to Pastor Nat. How many of you have been told that you should walk before you try to run? I think we all have. But the Apostle Paul, he did anything but that. The question is, why? We know from Scripture that to be an elder, there are some qualifications. For example, they are to be the husband of one wife. They are to be above reproach. They are to be teachers, not addicted to alcohol, not a recent convert. But there are some other qualifications as well. But just to hone in on that idea of not a recent convert, it's almost to say, walk before you run. In other words, you are to know the faith, to study the faith, to be discipled, to be prepared. But if there's one thing we know about the Apostle Paul is he was passionate in his conversion, and we know he ran before he even learned to walk. Again, the question is why? Well, that is what we want to talk about today as we continue our study in the book of Galatians. Today, we are picking it up in Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. In the previous few verses, the Apostle Paul has reminded the Galatian churches that the gospel message he has always preached was not created by man. It was not associated to religious tradition or even a famous teacher. It had nothing to do with his training in Judaism. We have to remember Paul wanted nothing to do with the gospel message. Before meeting Christ, he hated it. He wanted to destroy it. But we know that something happened. And that's where we pick it up in verse 15. But when he, who had set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. When considering the truth claims of Christianity, there are very few pieces of evidence more compelling than the conversion of Paul. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul lays out a very impressive list of reasons why he should brag. Paul, he was a religious zealot, he was a Pharisee, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, in other words, he had the right ancestry, he had the right name, but he had more. He had the right training. He was trained under Gamaliel, a famous and respected teacher. Well, if you go to Galatians 1, he was an up-and-comer. He was committed to the law. He was committed to the traditions of Judaism. He was, I think we would say, passionate to a fault. His influence, it was increasing. His stock value was increasing in the opinions of others. But then something happened. He would trade his prestige. He would trade his influence. He would trade his growth track to success. The question is why? Well, verse 15 gives us the answer. But when he, who had set apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me. That's the answer. You see, I don't want us to miss what Paul just said. Before the foundation of the world. 
When Paul was in his mother's womb, God had a plan. He had a plan for Paul. He was set apart before he was even born for this purpose of preaching the good news. Paul says this in Ephesians 1. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. You see, this is one of those divine mysteries in Christianity. Somehow, we have true free will. And yet, God chooses us before the foundation of the world. Before time and space began, God knew we would be born, and He chooses us for salvation and also has a plan for us. And that plan is ultimately for redemption. But we also know that God uses us intentionally. And like so many people, Paul thought he knew the plan. He, he was in the right job. He had the right training. He even had the right people around him. But God intervened. God put Paul on the right path. I have a friend and a mentor who often reminds me that we as Christians, we are all on the same path. As followers of Christ, God picks us up and he puts us on the same path. The question is, at what pace will we walk or will we run? Will we be running with a business suit on, or will we be running with a jumpsuit? Will we be on a path in a pulpit, or will we be in a bullpen? At times, I guess I kind of feel like Paul. I remember when being asked as a child, what do I hope to be when I grow up? I said, I want to be a business executive wearing a suit and a tie climbing the corporate ladder. Now, <laughs> I don't know what kid says that. I don't even know where I got that idea from. But that was my vision. And as a young man, I would start my own company. I eventually got into executive coaching and business consulting as well. But God had a different plan. Now, if you were to ask me 10 or even 15 years ago, would I become a pastor? I would have probably said, no way. I, I just don't see that in the cards. But God, before the foundation of the world, he chose me and he had a plan. Well, let's talk with Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney, two people who have been placed on God's path of salvation. But like all of you, they have a very unique walk. Arnie and Kara, 30 years ago, would you have imagined that God would place you where you are today? I would love for each of you to share a little bit about your story with us. Well, 30 years ago, I didn't even know that Easter had anything to do with Jesus. So, <laughs> <laughs> big shock there. Just rolling secular. But I mean, can you, but I mean, think about that. 30 years ago, I mean, if someone said, hey, you're going to be a Christian, you're going to be an author, you're going to be involved with ministry at a global level, I mean, what would have you said to yourself if you were able to talk to yourself? Would you have just laughed or just, I mean, what would have been the reaction to that? I think I would have been excited about it, Nat. Oh, wow. Uh, because I, at an early age, struggled with uh, the feeling that I wasn't enough, that I was created uh, as a mistake, an accident, or mm. e maybe mm. even created for evil. So it would have mm. gave me hope. It would have motivated me, I think. Mm. I would have been excited about it. Wow, I think that's really encouraging for people to, to remember. The message of, of the gospel is really radical. And it really does redeem people's perspectives on their lives. I think that's really cool. Arnie, what about you? 30 years ago, I mean, you were just a baby. But, I mean, it, can you imagine a few years after that knowing, like, where you'd be today? You know, it's so funny how uh, these questions come about and all of that. Just today, we were talking, you know, we're kind of in a crisis here at Back to the Bible with uh, 
funding. And just today, we were talking about Pastor Nat, and I believe we're 30 years apart. Really? Aren't you 38? 39. 39. We are 30, 30 years apart. Wow. And the conversation was, well, how would you handle this if you were Pastor Nat's age? Hmm. And it's, that's 30 years ago. Oh, man, this would be embarrassing. <laughs> it, it would be like, whoa. And it, it's just um, uh, not only as a non-believer is your perspective different, but also your age and mm. experience makes things different. And you combine the two together, and some of us are train wrecks mm. 30 years ago mm. because not only did we not believe in Jesus, but we were pretty – self-motivated and stupid hmm. and doing a lot of things to try to end up well, hmm. if if you will. So when you find somebody who's young, and I know young is a relative word, but who is trying to do the right things and maybe doesn't have the experience, but certainly spiritually is far more mature, it warms the heart. So even though you're asking me, I'm just saying the focus on younger people doing the right thing is amazing. And if mm. you don't believe it, put yourself back 30 years ago. Mm. And how would you handle that same situation? And at least for me, it would have been totally ungodly and it would have been embarrassing. I can't say for the kingdom mm -hmm. because I wasn't a believer, but I, I was a pretty um, – Selfish businessman, hmm. certainly to say the least. Well, then I guess we can say you've come a long way, but it's neat to see the, the path that God has put us all on. Again, different backgrounds, different experiences, different upbringings, different trainings, but yet God has put us on this path to run the race with intentionality, with passion, to live for the things that really matter. And I am convinced, as you are as well, God has you right where he wants you. And where you are today, you may not be there in five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, but you're there on purpose. God does not want you to miss the opportunity. Your age doesn't matter. Your background doesn't matter. Your future outlook, frankly, doesn't matter either where you think you might go because God wants to use you mightily wherever you're at. So we'd challenge you, get out there, get moving, get sharing the gospel and let God do the work. We'll be back with more of today's message. But first, here's a word from Pastor Nat about this month's issue of Win the Day. The headlines are pretty disturbing right now. In the midst of political division and civil unrest, we're still fighting a mysterious virus. But take heart, this won't last forever. The Prince of Peace is coming, and I've put together a series of devotionals to remind you of the truth and peace you can experience in Jesus right now. You'll find these encouraging devotions in the October issue of Win the Day, and we're looking forward to sending you a copy as a thank you for your gift to Back to the Bible. Make your request at 1-800-759-2425. That's 1-800-759-2425. Or if you prefer to give online, visit backtothebible.org, backtothebible.org. Now here's more of today's message with Pastor Nat. Many people ask, what is God's will for my life? What is His plan for me? Now, I'll be honest, friend, I don't know the answer for you. Or let me just say, I guess I don't know the specific answer, but I do know the general answer. I, I think it's the bigger answer. God's plan for your life is to glorify Him, truly loving Him by obeying Him and living on mission for Him. Now, chances are, God's not going to call you into the pastorate. Chances are, God's not going to call you overseas to be a missionary. But He is calling each one of us to live on mission for Him wherever we're at, to preach the good news to everyone that God puts in our path. You see, I truly believe that God has you right where He wants you. You are on the right path if you are His child. Today, you may be in the teacher role 
or you might be in the stay-at-home parent role. You might be a business owner. You might be a student, or you might even be unemployed. I'm going to tell you, you are right where God wants you to live on mission. That's true because you can reach people that I will never reach. You will reach people that your pastor can never reach. You will reach people that the person listening to this program in Washington or in Florida or in Jamaica or in South America or wherever, you can reach them that they cannot. God has you right where he wants you. You are on the path. My encouragement to you is to lean into it, to live on purpose right where he has you. You see, that's what Paul did. While going, he preached the gospel. When God wanted him to move, he moved him. But he was intentional wherever he was at. And it says here in Galatians 1 that Paul was called before the foundation of the world in his own mother's womb. God had this very plan for him to preach the good news to the Gentiles. Now, does that mean that he wasn't called to preach to the Jews as well? No, of course he was called to preach to the Jews as well. In fact, we know that he did. He did according to Romans 11. He was under obligation to preach the good news to everybody, just like you and I are today. But the fact that this Jewish zealot would give up everything to pursue a life of persecution and trouble, it means that something significant happened. And we know from Acts 9 that he would meet a risen Christ. This is one of the most compelling pieces of evidence for the truth of Christianity. Remember what I said earlier. Paul ran before he learned to walk in his faith. Listen to what Paul says at the end of verse 16. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Paul, after encountering a risen Christ, realized his call. He realized he was picked up and put on a new path. Again, we have to realize the fact that something incredible must have happened to him. He changed. Paul changed in an instant from being a persecutor of the church to a church planter. And as soon as he experienced the risen Christ, that is exactly what happened. That was the moment. As soon as he had that revelation from Christ, he was off running. He was so convinced. He was so transformed that he had to immediately go and preach the gospel. That's why he says he did not go and consult with flesh and blood. In other words, he didn't go back and try to corroborate the story. He didn't go and verify what he had received was in fact true. No, he didn't have to, because he had heard and he had received the message from the God-man, Jesus Christ himself. There was no greater authority than Christ. Paul says he didn't consult with anyone. Now, if there was anybody he should have gone and talked to, it would have been the Jerusalem apostles. But he didn't even go to them. Why? Because he received this gospel. From Jesus Christ himself, he did not need anyone to corroborate the message. Instead, it says he went away to Arabia, and then he returned again to Damascus. You see, when I observe Paul, I see that he was truly a soul saved and a life changed. There is no reasonable explanation for the conversion of Paul other than than seeing and hearing a risen Christ. For that matter, there is no other reason why his brother James, a Jerusalem apostle, would believe except for a risen Christ. We know from Scripture that Jesus' own brothers denied his divinity. 
They did not believe he was the Messiah and the Son of God. They didn't buy it. However, once James encountered a risen Christ, that changed his perspective. When we look at James and Paul, they are two of the greatest reasons why the resurrection of Christ should be believed. As soon as Paul encountered Jesus, he was off running down the path that God had put him on. Now, it's true, he didn't know everything, but he knew the most important part, that the long-awaited Messiah had come. Jesus, the Messiah, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. That changed everything. What about you? Have you experienced life transformation? Have you experienced that soul salvation through Jesus Christ? If not, I encourage you, do not delay. Tomorrow is promised to no one. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. Salvation, it doesn't come down to a prayer. Salvation doesn't come by asking Jesus into your heart. Salvation comes by recognizing who you are, a sinner in need of a Savior. Salvation comes by turning from your sin and turning to Jesus Christ as your only hope for forgiveness. You see, if you believe the gospel, that is, the true gospel, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again, if you really believe this, you embrace it, then you will experience a relationship with the God of the universe and a destiny forever changed. But what if you are listening today and you have experienced that salvation? You, you do believe. But maybe you are crawling along the path. If this is you, I encourage you, do not crawl any longer. Today, let God pick you up. Today, begin to develop a hunger for true, rich spiritual milk. Nourish yourself. Nourish yourself as you begin to walk, as you begin to jog, and as you begin to sprint down the pathway, preaching the good news to all you encounter. Now I get it. You may not be thrilled about your job, about the home you live in, but let me tell you something. God has you right where he wants you. We have the privilege to share the gospel that is God's message of forgiveness and true life in a world full of darkness and confusion and despair. By God's grace, not only do we get to live the reality of who we are in Christ, but we get to share the gospel in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, and wherever we go. It is true. We are not called to beat people down with the gospel, but we cannot cling to a social gospel either. We must declare the true gospel message. Why? Because it is the power of salvation to all who believe. I think this is a great opportunity to bring in my discussion partners, Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney. And Arnie, let's start with you. What is just that one thing on your heart today that you want to use to fire us up, to fire up believers, to get us focused and ready to do our jobs as disciples? It's a tremendous opportunity for the kingdom like never before because it's no longer comfortable being a Christ follower. Mm. It's not even comfortable being a cultural Christian. Hmm. 
anymore. Hmm. It's a tremendous opportunity. So it's it's not natural to sit on the bench, hmm. to be a pew sitter. Be, and I'm not talking about diving into the political f- mess. I'm just talking about this is a tremendous opportunity to stand up for Jesus. There's just look around the corner. There's people hurting hmm. everywhere that need Jesus. Yeah. Like never before. I mean, before they still needed it, but it was comfortable. And so, you know, it it was almost we were a culture. If you've got a Mercedes Benz, you know, making a hundred thousand, it's like you're comfortable. It's okay that you're going to hell. Yeah. Right. You, you know. But now you've got all from all walks of life, people really, really suffering. It's a great opportunity for Jesus, like there never has been, I think, at least in my lifetime. Right. Yeah, I think the opportunity is uh, uh, greater than ever. The question is, are we going to capitalize? And and one of the things I love about Back to the Bible is we are not for bench sitting. We are not for being idle in this race. We are challenging each other. Arnie, you are constantly challenging us as a staff to not just enjoy the ride, but get out there and be part of the ride. Go out there and make a difference with the gospel. God did not call us to be notional Christians. He did not call for us to be cultural Christians, but get out there and make disciples. I love that about you, and I love that about Back to the Bible. Now, Kara, yesterday we touched on this, but we talked about the difference between working for God's approval and working from God's approval. How has that changed your approach to life? Well, I think our works are more pure when we're not working for approval. So if I have to do something to earn my way to approval, then I really don't care about the soul of that person or whom I'm serving. They're just a task or a project then. Hmm. So I think our love, it sort of siphons that out. It becomes more pure, you know, our We don't really have a motive. It's just we really want to serve someone because we love them. Right. Well, and the motive is pure. I mean, you know, we're we're parents and Arnie, you know, you've got grandkids. But there is a difference when we receive a hug from a child or a, a grandchild that comes when they run in and they put their arms around us and say, I love you, Papa. I love you, Grandpa. I love you, Mom. I love you, Dad. Versus, hey, get over here, squirt, and give me a hug. That feels different because their motivation is different. They're not doing just to please you. They're not doing it just because you told them to, which is great that they're so obedient, but their motivation is just because they love you. And so they are displaying that with you. And and I have to think that that is what God experiences with us. When we work from our love and not for his love, it changes everything. Now, something that I thought about as I worked through this message was the idea that Paul had heard directly from Christ. And and I think some might think, hey, that gave Paul an advantage. And if we had that, if we had that message directly from Christ himself, we would be motivated just like Paul, if we had that same experience. But I don't know if that holds water. Uh, What do you guys think? I had to think about that because I've gone back to that too, what it would have been like to walk with Jesus and to see him and to see the nail holes in his hands. But it doesn't matter. The response of those who are redeemed in Christ is, or by Christ is the same. It's what do you want me to do? When God truly touches our hearts, it's, that's our only response. Hmm. So it's the same, Lord, may your will be done, and may you use me to do it. I know for me, when I start feeling that way, and like, you know, wow, I wish I could have been there, it's like you've got something even better, and that's God's Word. Hmm. And I hear from God, maybe not directly, but I certainly hear and see God working on a daily basis, approaching this question too. I just kind of chuckled because... (laughs) There are times when I'd say, man, that just really makes me mad That, because I'm just as stupid as anybody else. And if he would have spoke to me like he spoke to somebody, Moses or Paul on the road, of course I would have listened. But really, you have his word, and his word speaks between what you're studying and what you're looking at and what you're experiencing in the Holy Spirit. To me, It's maybe a little subtle, but oftentimes not even subtle. These are not subtle times. Mm -hmm. Um, I think God does speak to us just like he did 
back in the day, maybe even stronger. I'm so glad you said that because you're exactly right. The Bible we hold is God's word. When we read those red letters, guess what? Those are Christ's words. We can be confident, we can be sure of it. I mean, studies show that the Bible we hold today is the Bible that was written 2,000 years ago. We can be sure of it. So we do have God's word. Would it have been great to see Jesus on the Damascus Road? Absolutely. Would it have been great to be able to put our hands in his side and touch those wounds? Yeah, absolutely it would have. But because God is so faithful to his people and wanted his word preserved, we have it there in our hands, and of this we can be sure. Thank you for listening today. You know, here at Back to the Bible, your spiritual journey is our number one priority. So we want you to know that the latest issue of Win the Day is now available. And this month's edition highlights daily steps to help you walk in truth and peace. That's so important in today's chaotic world. So request your copy today at 1-800-759-2425. 1-800-759-2425. Or get the details at backtothebible.org. Pastor Nat here. Be sure to come back again tomorrow as we continue our study in Galatians. And as always, stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word.